What's up, this is Jono from Baron Carter and this is a commentary on Altringer. So the story of Altringham actually started out when I was watching a TV show called The Crown and there's a great episode that tells the story of Lord Altringham writing a pretty scathing piece in the late 50s about the Queen and he basically said she's out of touch, she's too upper class, she's stuffy, she's not really representative of the people. And he was seen very much as a controversial figure and the monarch saw him as a bit of an enemy. But as the story progresses it turns out that he was actually in service of the Queen and he was writing that piece because he wanted to help her become a more representative monarch. So I thought it was a really cool story, great fodder for a song. And, you know, I can never tell which songs are going to be the single or the opener for one of the new Baron Carter releases. But when I'd, when I'd written most of the songs for In a Concrete Room and, um, you know, Altering Them was already written, it always stood out to me as this is going to be the single. This is going to be the opener because, you know, it's a fairly mid-paced song. It's upbeat. I think it's fairly accessible to listen to. But um, one of the things I like about it is that it doesn't subscribe to the verse, chorus, verse, chorus format. It kind of takes you through this journey. And my goal with my music is to never subscribe to any particular framework or any particular genre. Um, but if you're not careful about writing songs and you just write lo lots of pieces that kind of glue together, then you can end up writing like 17 minute bizarre prog rock songs. And I don't particularly want to do that. So, I'm pretty pretty happy with how it uh, how it panned out. So let's dig in, put the old buds in, and I'll talk about how I wrote it. All right, here we go. So when I write music, I'm sure other musicians are the same. I never write the songs in the order that you hear them, right? So um, the intro to this song that you're hearing right now. I actually wrote that last and um, I'd written the whole song at this point uh, without the intro and it started out as with the main riff that you'll hear in a second. So if you've already heard this song, which I'm presuming most of you have, um, you'll already be familiar with the main riff in the song uh, and it just started out there. But I felt like it just started out while it was heavy and it was energetic, it just, it needed something else. It needed an introduction to kind of bring it in. So that's when I wrote this song, this da 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 and I thought, well, that sounds pretty cool. but that's a heavy downpicked riff going into a heavy downpicked riff. And it needed something that glued these two different riffs together. And I actually spent about three weeks trying to write it. And you'll hear it in just a second, but that kind of connective tissue is very short right at the beginning of the song. But I think it really helps bring in the heaviness of the main riff so it gives it much more punch when it comes in. You know, one of the things that's interesting about um, working with different drummers is um, is the precision in which they play. One of the things that I've always loved about Morton since I've worked with him is he's got the ability to play something like this, which is, you know, kind of a roll on a snare drum. And a, a, a not very good drummer would do that and there'd be massively varying levels of speed and volume and that would have to be fixed to the best of a producer's ability in the mix. Morton absolutely keeps that consistency when he's playing, but what I love about him is that he's got that level of precision, but he's also got the ability to feel loose. So he's loose while being perfectly in time, if that makes any sense whatsoever. But I think this, it's a subtle but important point. It just, this is just shines a light on how great of a drummer he is. So this is obviously the main riff. Um, I've talked previously in interviews and commentaries and stuff like that about the role of bass guitar in Baron Carter. It's very, very important to me. Um, you know, when I write the songs, um, I usually start out with, with the guitars. And a lot of guitarists who also play bass will tend to just use bass as a means to fatten up the guitars. And I think that is a travesty. Um, bass guitar is an important instrument in its own right. Um, and I always want to make it stand out in the same way that I made and do this, Cannibal Corpse do this. Many, many great bands really make the bass guitar a forefront of the music. Um, and uh, a good example is very subtle is in this, in, in this main riff where 
Um, you know, it's, it's kind of da 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 But there's a little riff, that, there's a kind of little run that goes down that you'll hear in just a second. And if you listen carefully, you'll hear the bass guitar is mirroring the guitar as it's going down at a high kind of um, octave. And instead of just kind of like rumbling around in the background. And I think it just adds a little bit of dimension to it. Even though it's exactly the same thing that guitar's playing, it adds a little bit more dimension. I'll point it out when it, when it plays. <laughs> So right at the beginning of the song here, it's kind of set in the historical context as the sewers wailed and, uh, and NASA's men prevailed. This is, you know, the late 50s, the Suez Canal conflict is going on. Um, and, you know, the, the, I'm not going to get too much into the lyrics. You can check out the lyric video to see what they're all about. But um, it, at the beginning, Altrincham is presented as this angry critic. And then as the song progresses and... You know, right now there's a lot of tightness in, in the playing. Like everything's, you know, your muscles are kind of like constricted together. Everything's very, it's difficult to explain, but like, it's not like the music is very open and free right now. It's, it's very tight and compressed. Uh, and I don't mean this, this in a production sense. I just mean in terms of the feel of the music. Um, so the, the vocals, the, the lyrics reflect that. But as we get into the more open passages later on, which I'll get, which I'll talk about. This is when Altrincham, as the character in the song, transitions more into an ally and, um, you know, a friend of the monarch as it goes along. Great Britain push into the pocket as the politics is monarchy fail. My pen is war. Just a quick comment about Ralph. So, you know, Ralph Sheepers, unsurprisingly, doing a killer job, as usual, with the vocals. What's interesting, uh, and some of you may not know this, about about Ralph, um, certainly within the context of Baron Carter, but most uh, singers, when they, when, they, when they record their parts, they go into a studio and they work with the producer. And there's usually somebody sat behind a mixing console with a microphone who's saying, do it again, do it again, do it again. And a singer will have to do, repeatedly take parts, you know, record parts over and over and over again until the producer gets exactly what they want to hear. You know, this was famously talked about by Bruce Dickinson from Iron Maiden when I think it was Number of the Beast and Martin Birch, the you know, super famous producer, you know, did a whole bunch of Iron Maiden albums as well as like Deep Purple and various other bands, made him sing this, the, I think it was the first couple of lyrics in, in Number of the Beast over and over again. And Bruce Dickinson was like throwing chairs around getting frustrated with it. What's interesting about this is that Ralph isn't in a studio when he's doing this. He's built a studio in his house. He's not working with another producer. He is himself the producer. So when he, you know, when he sends the, 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 his recorded parts to me, um, he's decided when it's the right lyric, when it's the right performance, when it's right for the mix. And it's, and it's remarkable. And, you know, one of the things, uh, you know, the way I kind of do this is when I've written the songs, I write the lyrics and then I record me singing um, the vocal melody. Because when I write the songs, I can hear the vocal melody in my mind. But I always say to Ralph, I want you to make this your own performance. I want you to feel like it's your art too, that you're not just doing what I want you to do. And he adds so much flavor, loads of harmonies and little moments in these songs. I'm going to point some of them out as we go through it. But given the fact that he doesn't have a, a producer, you know, barking at him to do it again, and this is all him, it just is a testament to his professionalism. So I mentioned earlier on about, you know, that main riff feels very tight and constricted in the playing. Um, and I am a huge fan of, of, of writing music that uh, relieves tension, right? So that tight riff there, I, I knew at this point in the song that it needed to go to um, a much more open section where the guitars are ringing out and the, and the bass is playing some like juicy little melodies in the background and the vocals really kind of ring out and feel big and bellowy. Um, because then that's where we get the light and shaded music. Like if you're just playing 150 miles an hour all of the time, it's just ba 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 it can get a little bit boring, right? So I love how it kind of, that tension is relieved and it becomes this big part and Ralph's vocals sound phenomenal. And then again, you can hear the bass in the background kind of holding up the melody. Just a 
good example. You know, now it's time to pave a brand new way. You can hear some of those grittier local harmonies that that Ralph recorded. It's fascinating when he sends over to me his recordings. It's like a whole bunch of Ralphs all singing together, and it sounds pretty cool. So you can kind of think of that section that we just heard as almost like a chorus, but you never hear it again. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, I like to break the verse chorus, verse chorus format where it makes sense. You know, there are some songs that very much adhere to a verse chorus, verse chorus format. Like I think more classic rock songs like Living on Running Low is a good example of this. Um, uh, I think another example would be Out of Time uh, or Truth of Power as well from Step Into the Plague. Some songs deserve that, um, but you don't have to kind of constrict yourself to them. But again, as I mentioned earlier on, to me, it's important to never forget that you're writing a song. Um, I think there are some bands where they, they, they write one section and then they write another one and then they write another one and they just keep on tacking more and more bits of song on. And then there's no cohesive whole to it. And one of the reasons why I like to write the songs I do is because I'm always hearing them back. And there's been many times where I've had, like, I think it was on Act 2, um, where the song actually ended up being even longer than it is. It's already over eight minutes long. But there were so many sections, like, this is just, this is just taking the listener down, a, down an alleyway that detracts away from the, the overall sense of a consistent unit if itself, in, in itself. <laughs> Let's go in the shadows. I watch you. You know what's funny about this particular part of the song was, um, you know, this is the main riff again being played. But when the guitars were playing it with the bass, it just kind of sounded a little bit more more samey. And uh, you know, uh, this guy called Jim Adams, who's a friend of mine who I who played guitar in Severed Fifth. One of the things that he always said to me over and over again is, "Never repeat yourself." Um, and every time I tend to repeat myself, I always hear Jim whispering in my ear saying, Bacon, you're repeating yourself again. So I knew I wanted to have that, that main riff playing again, but I thought, let's kill the guitars and see what it sounds like with just the bass. And I think it sounds pretty cool, especially when the bass is a little bit more distorted. It sounds a little eerie and creepy. Another little subtle thing there as well is Ralph's actually singing behind the lyric. Um, so if you hear it, he's, you know, you can hear this again, creepy little voice whispering in your ear. I love it. So there's two things I want to point out as we go into the next part of the song. One is, um, you're about to hear Ralph scream. Um, you know, when, when, um, I sent over the recording of me singing the, the, the song, um, you know, as food for thought around, around the vocals, um, there was no scream at this next point in the song. And he added this in there. And I've never really thought of Ralph as a, a screamer, right? You know, it's not like he sings in like a black metal band or a death metal band or anything like that. So, um, he just added it in there. And I love that when you work with great musicians is they'll think, you know what, that needs a scream at the, that particular point. And he just put it in there, it sounded killer. But then the next section of the song that's after the scream, um, again, I wanted it to kind of relieve the tension because we've, we've had this kind of upbeat main riff. And this is where we start getting into the reality of Altrincham being an ally to the Queen as opposed to being an enemy. I'll talk more about that when we get there. After the people's way. So, you know, I promise I see you, right? Uh, this is where it's making it very clear in the lyric that he's here to help the queen and to be in service of her success. Musically, um, when I was writing this kind of big open riff um, that was really designed as, I guess you could say it's a, a pre-chorus, but for a solo, like a pre-solo, um, this was designed to kind of build up towards a solo. Um, I originally had it where... I was kind of having a couple of different guitars harmonizing with each other and it didn't sound quite right to me. So this is when I came up with the idea of the vocal singing a melody and then the guitar mirroring that melody. And I love it when bands do that because we're used to hearing 
the same instrument harmonizing with each other. Guitars often, you know, play two different octaves and they, they play them together and they sound really great. We hear this with vocals all the time. If you listen to Queen are famous for this, obviously with their vocals, these amazing big harmonies or the pentatonics and people like that. But hearing two very different instruments, you know, a vocal and a guitar, um, mirroring different, mirroring the same melody rather, I think sounds pretty cool. So you can hear it in this section. <laughs> so now we get into the solo. Um, I struggle with solos, if I'm being honest. I've always considered myself uh, to be more of a rhythm guitarist. Um, you know, I kind of grew up on the meat and potatoes of listening to Iron Maiden and some of the great thrash guitarists like Dave Mustaine, James Hetfield, um, Kerry King, Jeff Hanneman, um, you know, Gary Holt, all these amazing rhythm players. Um, I was never particularly motivated historically to be a particularly good lead guitarist because the musical theory bores me. I'm not interested in scales and modes and stuff like that. So I have no idea what I'm playing. Um, so I think I've always kind of struggled a little bit with of, um, a lack of confidence in my, in my lead playing. But, you know, despite that, I always have a sense of clarity on what I want the solo to sound like. How I'm going to get there is a whole separate thing. And, you know, to, to give you an example, if you listen to a band like Megadeth, the classic era, Rust in Peace, you've got Dave Mustaine, who is an amazing lead player, but it's frantic, it's, it's, it's jagged, it's erratic, it's, it sounds like just this flurry of notes fired out of a gun, and it feels like luck that they landed in the correct places. Uh, but then you've got Marty Friedman, who is this remarkably technically gifted, thoughtful player with all of these exotic Asian scales that sound really, uh, and Eastern scales that sound amazing. Um, my aspirations are more towards the Marty Friedman side of the fence. Um, so when I wrote the solo for, for this song, for Altrincham, I wanted to write something that was really thoughtful and, um, and intentional and melodic in nature. Um, and in other songs, I'll want to write something that's frantic and insane. I mean, if you listen to the solo in Truth to Power from Step Into the Plague, or you listen to the solo, uh, my solos in, in Rat Lines, where I have a solo battle with Tom from Carcass, um, they're much more erratic in nature in, in some parts. So this solo was really intended to be much more melodic, and I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. You know, it's interesting when you're, when you're recording music, sometimes um, uh, these kind of little magical moments will happen that you would never expect. It can be a little bit of guitar feedback or it could be something that you do on a whim and it just happens. So when I was recording this solo, um, I was playing this bit, it kind of goes up, you'll hear it in just a second, it kind of goes up the fretboard. Um, and then, you know, I play this... Um, this JP7 guitar, this Music Man JP7, I've got a tremolo arm that's hanging off the side, like a whammy bar. Uh, and I was going up and I hit this note and then I just, with my little finger, I don't know why I did this, I just whacked my tremolo arm. Um, Steve Vai does this in some of his playing. When you hit it like that, it has this kind of trill sound. It is like, it almost sounds like a bird warbling. Uh, I'll, I'll point when it, when you hear it, but it was complete matter of accident, like when, when the way it kind of popped up. When I heard it back, I was like, whoa, that sounds cool. <laughs> This next section was really important. Uh, this is really where the allegiance toward between Altrincham and the Queen um, occurs. Um, and lyrically, that's really important. But I also wanted the music to sound like um, we were, again, reaching a crescendo um, because the song ends with the main riff kind of coming in the da 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 da
uh, again, because I love that sense of building towards something. Um, but I wanted it to sound big and melodic. And there's lots of kind of melodic guitars in the background that are gluing together the, 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 the vocal parts and, and the lyrics. I don't know if you can hear it. The, the again, the melody of the vocal and the the the, the lead guitars in the background are exactly the same. You know, when Ralph sent over that high vocal, that wah, I was so excited. I just kept hearing it over and over. I just kept replaying it backwards and forwards. And it was amazing. I was like, wow, this, this incredible vocalist, right? He's been singing in Primal Fear for years, singing in Gamma Ray. And I get to listen to him singing, hitting these notes on my music. It's killer. Um, and I was really excited about that. But then when the song was mixed and, and Jacob mixed this this particular part, you know, there's that kind of gap where the main guitar, one of the one of the guitars plays the main riff. You know, so he goes da 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 and and Morton's just kind of keeping the beat going with his bass drum. And then Jacob added this and um it's that boom at the end. And I actually dropped this into some of the mix notes that I was sharing with Jacob was like, holy shit, that sounds fucking incredible the way he put that thud in there i think it's morton hitting his bass his kind of floor toms and then some effect but it just sounds absolutely huge when it brings in that last riff This kind of stomping sound and crowd sound that you can hear in the background was all Ralph Sheeper's invention. Um, I actually didn't originally put that in, but he just added in it in and he thought it would sound cool and it did sound cool. There you go. There you have it. Well, thank you, uh, my friends, for listening to me waffle along about a Baron Carter song. I hope you found this interesting to peek behind the scenes of how the song was written. Uh, I just want to say a huge thank you to Ralph Sheepers and to Morton Gates Sorensen for their amazing work uh, on the songs, and of course to Jacob Hansen for mixing it as well. And thank you, most importantly, to you, to you, horrible lot, for listening. Peace out. I promise.